Hello all, Bob Pisani on the balcony of the New York Stock Exchange. I've been down here for 26 years and it still gives me a thrill to walk into the building. This is the famous 1903 room. This building's been here since 1903. This is the original room, the original trading room. Those are called posts down below me where the DMMs, the designated market makers, make markets in stocks. Each one has a specific stock they make a market in and most of them in many markets, uh, many stocks right now. So it's been a really interesting week. We're here to answer some of your questions. Uh, my colleague in the social media team, Katie Kunz, is here next to me. Good to see you. Nice Haven't see seen you in person in a little while. Yeah, it's good to be back. It's great to be here uh, and it's great to have you here. Uh, what kind of questions do we have? All right, so first up, uh, how are markets reacting to the latest Fed decision? Well, uh, Katie was asking how are markets reacting to the latest Fed decision and they pretty much, the investing community pretty much got what they wanted. So think of what the markets wanted. What the market wanted was some acknowledgement from uh, Chairman Jay Powell uh, that they were going to pause somehow. Why would they want to pause? The market has been arguing that the banking crisis is going to cause the economy to slow down, which is what the Fed wanted, but it's going to accelerate that. And they want the Fed to acknowledge that. The second thing is we've had, what, 400 basis point increase, 450 basis point increase in interest rates in the last year. The market wants the Fed to stop and say, you know, let's just figure out what this is doing to the economy. So the good news, the bad news is they did not explicitly say we are pausing. They didn't do that, but they came very close. So, for example, on, on the rate hikes, there was a line uh, in the uh, in the press release where it said ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. In the last meeting, they said that. This time, they said something different. They said additional policy firming may be appropriate. You have to be un practiced at reading Fed speak, but what happened here was they replaced a statement that said, oh, we're going to keep raising interest rates uh, at the last meeting with the current one, which basically was a kind of a wimpy statement, and eh, maybe sometime in the future we will. That's a difference in tone. The second thing that they did that the market liked is Powell in his press conference very explicitly acknowledged the banking crisis and said, yo, yeah, this is having an effect uh, on, our, uh, on our thinking and our, our potential forecast that was a factor in us only ranging a quarter point. So that's what the market wanted to hear. They didn't say, Powell didn't say, oh, no, we're done raising rates. That's it. He did not say that. But he came close to implying that we were near the end of the cycle. That was good enough for the markets yesterday. All right, so Bob, do you think uh, Congress or the Biden administration will raise the insurance limit for bank deposits? Uh, Katie was asking um, whether Congress or uh, the Biden administration is going to raise the insurance limit. So this is a, a, at the heart of the banking problem um, right now. So you probably know the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission, uh, uh, has a $250,000 limit on uh, bank deposits for insurance. So if you have up to $250,000, you're completely insured. Whether the bank goes under, doesn't go under, doesn't matter. There has been a lot of discussion about raising that uh, after Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. The problem here is that there is things, there's explicit and implicit guarantees. So there's an explicit guarantee that if you have $250,000 or less in your bank account, it doesn't matter, you're, you're guaranteed. The government's guaranteeing it, whether the bank collapses, doesn't collapse, whatever. The question was, what happens above that? And when, when they came to rescue Silicon Valley Bank, they wiped out the shareholders and the bondholders, but the depositors were made whole, even the people above $250,000. How did they do that? Well, there are emergency facilities that the, the FDIC has to help rescue depositors at banks, uh, and they activated that. So. At the same time, the Federal Reserve also offered lending to banks who might need to borrow money because deposits are down and they need more money in, the, in, their, in their reserves. So essentially what happened was there was an implicit guarantee for everybody. And Powell and Yellen, who's the Secretary of the, the Treasury, uh, has repeatedly said that bank deposits are safe. Now, remember something. They don't have an explicit guarantee above 250000 They can't. Only Congress can change the law. But both Powell and Yellen have said, don't worry, folks, your deposits are safe. The, the implication is if there is another bank failure, the depositors will be made whole there. 
They can't go out, though, and say everybody in the country is insured to infinity. They don't have the power to do that. But if another individual bank goes under, their implication is we will save the deposit holders. So the problem is the, the stock market wants a more explicit guarantee. What's the explicit? Well, then Congress changes the law and says instead of 250,000, it's pick a number, 500,000, 1 million, infinity. That's the debate. Now, they're going to have a hearings next week in Congress to talk about this. The market very much would like them to do that. Here is the problem. Number one, it could be expensive. Nothing's free. You pay, the banks will pay insurance to the FDIC to insure these higher deposit limits. That means the cost for them is going to go up. Their earnings are going to go down. They're going to charge depositors more too. It's not risk-free. The other is what we call moral hazard. Do we really want to tell all the banks in the world, and excuse me, in the United States, go ahead, do whatever you want, because your depositors are going to be guaranteed. They want a certain amount of risk management from the bank. So it's a very, very tricky question. We want to make sure everybody feels safe. You shouldn't feel worried if your deposits are in a bank that the bank's going to go under. Not now, not in the 21st century. But banks are businesses, and they should be managed prudently. So it's a tough question. We'll hear hearings next week. So, Bob, will more banks fail? Is this just the beginning of financial institution failures? Uh, Katie was asking if more banks would fail, um, or, and is this just the beginning? I don't know the answer to that question, but I like to think that we're closer to the end than the beginning. And I'll tell you what this has highlighted. The problem with capitalism is a lot of it is based on faith. I mean, think about this. You, you have to believe that the bank's not going to go under, that your deposits are safe. In modern banking, if you've got $100 million in a, in a bank, the bank has $100 million in deposits, the bank doesn't sit on $100 million. That's not how it works. They take most of the money, I mean, and literally about 90%, and they lend it out. So if everybody comes and asks for their money back, they don't have the money. It's lent out. They might only have 10%. And so if people start asking for the money, they have to, they have to sell uh, those d liquid assets they have, either cash or stocks or bonds. And in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, they had a lot of bonds, and the value of the bonds were lower because interest rates had gone up. That's a very unusual situation to happen. Most people don't, you don't have runs on banks anymore. That's a very unusual situation. So I like to think that once you stabilize the, the system by telling everybody, stop worrying about it, the faith comes back. So remember, Faith is the key to the game here. You've got to believe the money's there, and it's going to be there when you go and ask for it. If you stop believing that, well, what are you going to do? Sit on your mattress with your money in your, uh, under your mattress? That's not a way a modern economic system actually works. By the way, the Latin word for, for faith is creder, credit. That word credit actually in Latin means faith. So when people give you credit, there's faith. Faith that you're going to pay it back. The whole system has to work on that kind of faith. So, Bob, where do tech stocks stand? Katie's asking where tech stocks stand. They're rallying. They're doing great. Uh, Apple, Microsoft are at six-month highs. Why are they rallying? There's a hope <laughs> that the Federal Reserve is going to pause here. That's the point. And that interest rates will come down. Tech stocks, growth stocks, are particularly sensitive to higher interest rates uh, because uh, they compete against bonds and higher, they have higher borrowing costs very much weigh on, on growth stocks uh, in general. So they've had a really interesting rally, but remember, it's based on the idea that interest rates are not gonna keep going through the roof. If all of a sudden, remember we two-year treasuries were at 4.8, 4.9% a few weeks ago. If they go back, if they go over 5%, tech stocks are gonna go back down. So. Again, a little bit of a game being played here by certain investors that the Fed is, in fact, going to do either a one more hike and done or a pause, something like that. Um, and if it doesn't happen, then tech stocks will have some trouble. So, Bob, you've recently written about your mother becoming a buyer of bank CDs and treasury bonds. <laughs> Tell us about that. I, I, I've been making a joke about my mother uh, because if, that's, if this is not a bellwether, I don't know what is. Uh, my mother uh, has bitterly complained that she never got any return on her bank account. You know, like 0.4% for a, a decade she's complained about this. 
So she was at her bank the other day and called me up and said, Robert, I was, she was rolling over a, a CD. She wanted, and she was, had money in a bank account and they were offering her four or four and a quarter percent. She was astonished. She said, Robert, I haven't had this in years. I'm so happy. And she said, I've heard about these. You can invest directly in treasury bonds rather than a bank CD. How do you do that? Now, when your mother calls you and asks you about the bond market and asks you about 4% returns and I might put more money in it uh, from my bank account, that's, that's a yield top. That's a, <laughs> when my mother starts talking about it, that's when you know this has seeped into the country. And this has been going on for months now where a lot of people are taking money out of stocks, for example, and buying 4.8% two years, treasuries. And the thinking is, people ask me this all the time, Bob, why should I try to figure out the stock market, which is a risky game right now, I have no idea what's going on, when I can get almost 5% for a one year or a two year? And that is not a stupid question. And it goes to what, what you call uh, the equity risk premium. How much are you gonna get paid for a risky investment like stocks over a guaranteed investment like a government treasury? I'll, I can buy a one year treasury five percent a few a couple of weeks ago and guarantee you get the money back in a year plus five percent right well you can't do that with the stock market the reason the stock market outperforms long term against the bond market is because it's riskier and riskier assets have to return a higher amount it's a lot of people stand around and say well why bother i can't figure this out maybe the stock market will be up 10%, maybe it won't be, but uh, I'm going to, for the moment, I'd be happy of just getting 5% on a guaranteed return. And that's a big, big reason the stock market's had headwinds, because bonds compete against stocks for money. If people have more faith, they'll get 5%, no risk going to bonds, that's going to pull money away from the stock market. And my mother's reflecting that, you know, my mother, the bond maven, you know, who would have thought, you know? Uh, so. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to those kinds of, that, that's like the shoe shine boy. There's that funny story about the shoe shine boy t talking about the stock market, giving stock tips. When a shoe shine boy starts giving stock tips, you know the stock market's at a top because everybody's talking about the stock market. When your mother calls you and starts talking about the bond market, you pay attention because my mother doesn't call me and talk about the bond market very often. So Bob, you wrote this week that investor pessimism is reaching extremes. What does that mean for markets? Well. Sentiment, these are sentiment indicators. So there's a thing called the uh, Global Fund Survey that Bank of America Merrill Lynch puts out. They survey like 140 big global fund managers and they ask them, what do you think is gonna happen in the next few months? And pessimism was extraordinarily high, like you know, 20 year highs here. There's, they slice and dice it dif different ways. Uh, and same with retail sentiment in the last week. Um, there's one called the American Association of Individual Investors Sentiment Survey. What do you think the market's going to do in the next six months? Are you bullish, bearish, or neutral? And you know, the bullish levels were you, you know near near multi-year lows. The bearish levels were near multi-year highs. So these are sentiment indicators. There's a couple things about sentiment indicators. Number one, they they're really um, contrarian indicators. Think about this. When everybody's pessimistic, um, it often is signs of a market bottom. And number two, they're really only useful at extreme levels. I mean extreme levels. So, and they are at extreme levels. When you have this global fund manager survey where the sentiment's at 20-year lows, that's a pretty extreme number. So what happens here is people start paying attention to it when it has these extremes. Because normally when you have those extremes, and extreme pessimism often associated with a market bottom. Now that's not a guarantee, but it's a good way of looking at it. And that's why I've talked about these sentiment indicators recently, because they're, such, they're at such extreme levels. Otherwise, I wouldn't pay much attention to them. So Bob, going off of that, how do you know when the market has bottomed? Well, that's the problem. You don't know. Um, you, there, there is no oracle. You use these things. Uh, we talk about these sentiment indicators. Um, we talk about the VIX, which is the volatility index. When it spikes up rather dramatically, those are often associated with, with market bottoms, at least short term. Um, so, for example, the VIX is usually around 20, 22. When it goes above 30, I start paying attention because in the past, recently in the last few years, that has often been associated with short-term market bottoms. But 
we don't, there is nothing that will tell you that we are at some kind of perfect bottom anywhere. You can have situations where the market goes down, then rallies again, then goes back down. It's called a long-term bear market, and you get these these bull market rallies in the middle of this thing. So you could look at sentiment indicators. You really want to deal with this and not make yourself crazy. Be a long-term investor. Don't be a, don't be an active trader. It's very difficult to uh, do really well actively trading all day long in and out over many years. You want to have a plan. You want to know what your risk tolerance is. You want to uh, know how much money you want to have in stocks versus bonds versus real estate. You want to put money in on a regular basis and you want to stay invested and don't think you can time markets. The academic literature is overwhelming. People do not successfully time markets, not even professionals. So the way to figure out is, is to sort of not worry. The way to figure out if we're at a market bottom is don't worry about it. Uh, I, I've talked many times about the qu people say we're at a market bottom. I say, look, how old are you? And how long do you think you're going to live? And what is your risk tolerance for the market? You can ans answer a few simple questions to figure out whether, you know, I should put of my retirement fund, I should have 65% in stocks or 75 or 85 or 15% in bonds or 5%. You can answer that in a, a half an hour with a professional investor uh, or a professional advisor will tell you about that. And after that, it's like, how long are you going to live? So I'm going to be very, I, I wrote a book recently, Shut Up and Keep Talking, Lessons on Life and Investing from the Floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Katie and I talked about it. And there's a whole chapter in there about what I own, just so it's not so mystical. Too many people make a big mystery out of this. I describe what I own and I describe how long I think I'm going to live. I'm 67 and I think I'm going to live to about 90. That's 23 more years. And you know what that means? That means I'm not dying next year. Or at least I don't think I am. And that means 23 years is an awful long time. I can assure you, 2022, which was not a good year for the stock market, is going to be a very distant memory in less than 10 years. And uh, 2009 and 2008 were not good years either. 2008 was not a good year. Uh, but that's a distant memory. And you don't pull money out at market bottoms. Uh, you don't do that. Not if you have a long-term plan. And that's the way I looked at it. So again, when you're, even in my age, while 2022 looked awful, you might panic and say, oh, I got to pull all my money out. You probably pulled it out at the wrong time. That's the odds. You probably are wrong. And sticking with the market, as long as you believe in the market long term, even if you've been dealing with some down years, not a bad idea. And again, talk to a professional investor, a right, professional Bob. advisor, I should say. That's all the questions we have for this week. They're really good questions. By the way, you guys submit this. I don't submit these questions. You know, they come from you. So uh, I'm always amazed at how the, the astuteness of the questions. Guys are very much on top of things. I appreciate it.